for the game anyway, and you're going to be in the area, please. Happy Halloween. I just wanted to let you all know that BALSA and the Legal Voices of Children and Youth are going to the Family and Children's Center to host a Halloween party for them today at 6 to 7.30, so please come. Welcome to our debate on affirmative action. My name is Rachel Hanley. I'm the president of the American Constitution Society. Briefly, this Friday we do have an event at 12.30. Dean Meyer will be speaking on the impact of voter ID laws nationally. You're all invited to attend. Now, concerning our debate, our prompt, our, our question, in light of Fisher versus, United, versus the University of Texas, result, colleges and universities should abandon their use of affirmative action programs, including preferences for athletes, let's see, veterans, and minority communities in the admissions process. Our moderator today is Professor Veronica Root. Professor Root comes to Notre Dame from the D.C. office of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher's litigation department. Prior to this, she clerked for Fifth Circuit College <coughs> of New York. As a visiting assistant professor, Professor Root will hold a two-year position similar to a postdoctoral appointment. She teaches and researches in the fields of legal ethics and employment discrimination. <coughs> Her scholarship also focuses on racial diversity within the legal profession. Professor Root received her undergraduate degree, cum laude, from Georgetown University's Donna <coughs> School of Business with a B.S. in Business Administration. She received her J.D. from the University of Chicago Law School, where she served as managing editor of the Chicago Journal of International Law. During her final year of law school, she served legal extern to the Honorable Virginia Kendall of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. Arguing for the resolution is Mr. Ilya Shapiro. Ilya Shapiro is a senior fellow in Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute and editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Before joining Cato, he was a special assistant advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues and practiced international, political, commercial, and antitrust litigation at Patton, Boss, and Cleary Gottlieb. Shapiro has contributed to a variety of academic, popular, and professional publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, the LA Times, and USA Today. From 2004 to 2007, he wrote the Dispatches for Purple America column for tcsdaily.com. He regularly provides commentary for media outlets such as CNN, Fox News, ABC, CBS, NBC, the Colbert Report, and NPR. <coughs> Shapiro has provided testimony to Congress and state legislatures, and as coordinator of Cato's amicus brief program, filed more than 100 friend of the court briefs in federal courts, including the Supreme Court. He is a member of the Legal Studies Institute's Board of Visitors at the Fund of American Studies, with an inaugural Washington Fellow at the National Review Institute, and has been an adjunct professor at the George Washington University Law School. Before entering private practice, Shapiro clerked for Judge E. Brady Jolly of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He holds an A.B. from Princeton University and a J.D. from the University of Chicago Law School. Shapiro is a member of the Bars of New York, the District of Columbia, and the U.S. Supreme Court. Arguing against the resolution is Mr. Melvin Butch Hollowell. Melvin Butch Hollowell serves as general counsel for the Detroit branch of the NAACP, the nation's largest and most active chapter. In August 2012, he was appointed to the legal committee of the National NAACP by National Chair Rosalind Brock. He has also served as chair for the Legal Redress Committee for the NAACP, working on issues including affirmative action. His most recent affirmative action works were before the Sixth Circuit in Cantrell versus Granholm. He worked with the ACLU, winning a panel decision in favor of using race as a factor in university admissions. As general counsel, he oversees a team of 60 lawyers, professors, and judges. He also developed a pro 
program called Stops and Crops, which educates youth and law enforcement on their constitutional rights and responsibilities. The success of the program has grown to be national in scope. Mr. Hollowell's public service includes being appointed the state of Michigan's first insurance consumer advocate by the state's governor in 2007 and serving as the national representative for consumers on the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. He has also served as counsel for the Gore Lieberman 2000 presidential recount and was elected the first African American chair of the Michigan Democratic Party. Mr. Hollowell received his BA from Albion College and his JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. In 2008, he was awarded the Wolverine Bar Association President's Award, and he is a member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar and Michigan State Bar, and life member of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals Judicial Conference. Pursuant to a coin toss, Mr. Shapiro will have the opening statement. Thanks very much. Uh, pursuant to the coin, coin toss, I actually elected to kick, but uh, apparently uh, I'm having a debate here. And actually, the last time I was here was in during the uh, I was in law school in Chicago and came down to the uh, for a football game uh, in, in 2002. As I said, Notre Dame was uh, ranked in the top ten, wore their green jerseys against Boston College, and promptly lost. So I hope that my visit doesn't portend a similar uh, outcome for you all this weekend. Um, uh, look, I want to uh, start off by saying what this uh, debate is and isn't about. This is not a debate about affirmative action, you know, outreach programs, whether we should be encouraging lots of people to achieve, uh, you know, economically or educationally or what have you. It's not about uh, whether racial minorities should have opportunities to succeed in our society, remedying the ills of our educational system or our social welfare system. Uh, or what have you, or you know, the, the race problem in America in, in general. That's much too broad. Uh, this is a debate about, well, through the context, through the lens of Fisher versus the University of Texas, uh, it's a debate about racial spoils and whether, based on the color of somebody's skin, they should, be, uh, they should get preference uh, in admission to higher education. And indeed, whether government officials, uh, meaning state administrators uh, uh, in, univers in, in public universities, uh, whether their feet should be held to the constitutional fire when they employ race in their decision making. Uh, and let's just be clear about uh, what is uh, going on here. This is not a lot of people around the country when you talk about racial preferences or affirmative action more, more broadly. Um, I think that it's just a, you know, when, when candidates are equal, uh, well, we'll just give the, the tie goes to the racial minority just, you know, as a, as a symbol of uh, progress in our society or what have you. Uh, this is not, these preferences are not just, you know, the tie goes to a particular minority, the approved minority. Asians don't count in, in Texas. You have to be, you know, one of the uh, government uh, favored types of minorities. Uh, there are serious mismatches, differences in terms of uh, how much this racial preference is worth. For example, uh, under the uh, University of Texas at Austin program that's at issue here, uh, what they have is uh, three quarters of their admitted class or the freshman class is admitted under what's called the top 10% law. Uh, if you go to a, a, any high school in Texas, the top 10% is guaranteed admission to uh, the college. The remainder of the, the 25% of the class uh, has other things that, that can be considered, not just the top 10%. And this whole case, the argument before the Supreme Court, is about whether race can be a factor uh, towards that 25%. Uh, and the statistics in terms of uh, what kind of uh, candidates, applicants, uh, admittees uh, come into the freshman class from that non-top 10% uh, plan, the gap in the math and verbal SAT scores between blacks and whites is about 200 points. Between blacks and Asians is about 230 points. The first year college GPA gap between blacks and whites, again, admitted under this non-top 10% non, non -top program, is roughly um, a C plus versus a B or a B minus average. In the College of Liberal Arts, the black-white gap in first year freshman GPA is C plus versus a B. And the four-year graduation rate for whites and Asians is roughly 55%, for blacks, roughly 40%. So race is a big, a huge, and as the University of Texas admits, often the determining factor, not just one of many uh, in terms of uh, a sort of holistic 
uh, review. In this case, Abigail Fisher, who's white, was denied admission even though her academic credentials exceeded those of many admitted minority applicants. She challenged the school's use of race in selecting its freshmen, but lost before the lower courts because of the, courts, uh, the Supreme Court's 2003 precedent involving the University of Michigan <coughs> Law School, Grutter versus Bollinger. In Grutter, the court uh, said that using race as a factor, but not one tied to quotas or a set number of points, was justified in the name of diversity. But UT Austin treats race in a different way and gets different results than did Grutter's program. That is, Grutter upheld Michigan's racial preferences because the school showed that minority enrollment would have plummeted without them, an assertion itself belied, by the way, by California's experience after Prop 209, which outlawed racial preferences in public education and employment in that state. While UT Austin had already achieved real diversity beyond even that created by Michigan's preferences through its race-neutral top 10% law. Uh, a panel of the Fifth Circuit, nevertheless, my old stomping grounds and Professor Root's old stomping grounds, nevertheless affirmed, uh, saying that they were bound by Grutter. Judge Emilio Garza uh, concurred specially, saying essentially that he was bound, but that Grutter seemed to conflict with the Equal Protection Clause. And the Fifth Circuit then voted 9-7 to seven against rehearing the case on Bonk over a sharp dissent from the Chief Judge Edith Jones. Uh, who emphasized how the ruling would allow states to play fast and loose with Grutter's requirement that states narrowly tailor um, their race-conscious programs. And that's how the case got to the Supreme Court, where I, Cato, filed an amicus brief supporting Abby Fisher and arguing that the Fifth Circuit, in showing blind deference to the UT Austin administrators, uh, was not um, engaging in the constitutionally Supreme Court required strict scrutiny when racial preferences are at issue. Uh, the lower court explicitly declined to evaluate the merits of the school's decision, instead um, just accepting the assertion of diversity in, in good faith. Under this rule, a public university's mere assertion of that interest, irrespective of the precise circumstances at issue or the form of the program, trumps an applicant's right to be treated as an individual rather than a racial specimen. It kind of echoes the kind of arguments that were brought to courts in the 50s and 60s. Indeed, and the University of Texas uh, was arguing for segregation using the same arguments in terms of academic freedom and they know best uh, how to employ um, admissions programs. The Fifth Circuit ignored the Supreme Court's uh, requirement, not just in Grutter, but the 1989 case of uh, City of Richmond versus Crossan, that the government demonstrate a, quote, strong basis in evidence for racial classifications in order to smoke out the illegitimate motivations that often underlie uh, their use. Uh, the court said in Crossan, quote, the history of racial classifications in this country suggests that blind judicial deference to a legislative or executive pronouncement of necessity has no place in equal protection analysis. Yet blind deference is the only possible characterization of what the uh, Fifth Circuit employed here. Um, Grutter doesn't compel this result. Contrary to popular belief, Grutter didn't overrule the settled precedent uh, requiring a strong basis in evidence to support a government policy that uh, judges people based on their race, even where its interest is one that the court has recognized in general terms to be compelling here, diversity. Absent such a showing, the court said, quote, there is simply no way of determining what classifications are benign or remedial and what classifications are in fact motivated by illegitimate notions of racial inferiority or simple racial politics. A strong basis in evidence is essential to define the contours of the government's interest um, and make possible the narrow tailoring that's required any time uh, a use of racial classifications is to survive. Uh, strict scrutiny. So in effect here, one way that the court could go is to say Grutter is still good law, diversity is still a compelling interest, but look, you've already achieved diversity. Indeed, the uh, uh, percentage of, of both blacks and Hispanics was higher after the top 10% program than before when the university was actually considering race. Um, uh, and, uh, for example, the percentage of Hispanics was greater than the percentage of Asians. And the university is here arguing that the Hispanic uh, popular student body has not reached a critical mass, while the Asian body uh, has. There's a lot of uh, weird 
Actually, there's a lot of weird contradictions that, that have come out uh, in the argument and in the briefing. For example, if race is used too much, that makes it unconstitutional. But if it's used too little um, and it, it's not really determinative, then it suggests that there's no compelling reason for using it at all. The critical mass has to be measurable to some extent, or else the schools are given a blank check to discriminate. Um, but it won't be clear if the, if the schools reach the point at which preferences are necessary to achieve the critical mass. But if it's a precise amount, you know, what, you know, a certain percentage, well, then that's a quota uh, or a point system that, that the court has said is illegal. If schools simply take students at their word about their race or ethnicity, then they can game the system, you know, just check a box. Uh, but if they don't, then the university, in effect, establishes a blood quantum requirement, something like the, the Nuremberg one drop rule or, you know, one of your grandparents or whatever the qualification might be, um, as, as Chief Justice Roberts uh, said in the Lulak v. Perry case, the redistricting case, but he says it's a, it's a sordid business, this divvying us up by race. Likewise, there's the problem of whether, for example, it makes sense to lump in, say, Cambodians with Pakistanis and Filipinos, uh, uh, all in a, in a well, single racial category, or, say, uh, uh, immigrants from Jamaica with long-term residents of Queens, uh, or uh, Mississippi, um, you know, a lot of different types of people that are uh, being reduced to their skin color. If a school wants multifaceted diversity, then shouldn't it follow that it should give preferential treatment to wealthy African Americans, uh, even if there's a shortage of them, if there's a shortage of them, compared to disadvantaged whites and blacks. And indeed, that's often the case of, of what's, uh, what's happening. The importance of the strong basis and evidence requirement is confirmed by UT's claim that its use of racial preferences was necessary to achieve this critical mass. The uh, dubious but accepted e excuse me, evidence in Grutter demonstrated that absent preferences, the University of Michigan's law school's uh, minority student population would have dropped to almost nothing. That is certainly not the case here, again, because of the, the top 10 program. So as I was saying, the court could just say, everything's in place, but UT, you already have your diversity, you've met it, you have no more <coughs> compelling interest, and indeed, um, uh, there's evidence that uh, you know, the only thing that the consideration of race, often determinative race, again, against uh, people like uh, Abby Fisher, is to admit something like 20 to 30 more um, uh, uh, preferred minorities. It certainly not, doesn't have an effect uh, on the critical mass uh, one way or another. Fuck. Okay. Finally, even if uh, UT Austin can show that racial preferences were necessary for some legitimate <coughs> reason, its chosen paradigm for applying these preferences is arbitrary. As I said, the different types of classifications, there are not enough Hispanics, even though there are more of them than there are uh, of Asians. It's very much reminiscent of the, the Jewish quotas in the 50s and 60s. Again, we want to promote the right kind of diversity in a certain way to, you know, because uh, you know, Asians are too math-minded or what have you. They're not speak, they don't speak up in class enough, whatever the reason why they're not uh, uh, preferred type of, of minority. Um, but the result would be the same even if UT could demonstrate that racial re references are necessary to achieve a critical mass. This whole concept, uh, as I've been saying, is arbitrary in uh, every respect. I mean, the UT's tried to argue that you need a critical mass in every single class, even classes of as, as low as five people. And the court has said that you can't engage in racial tokenism, so you can't just require <coughs> one person per minority group. Well, in a class of five, by definition, you can't have even two of each uh, you know, minority group. So there's, it's, it's a weird way to, to measure this thing. Far from necessary to realize any legitimate end, critical mass is a hindrance to achieving what Justice Kennedy in his Grutter dissent, and on whom I think this case uh, swings, quote, the harmony and mutual respect among all citizens that our constitutional tradition has always sought. So in short, I think the Supreme Court should rein in UT Austin's unbridled use of race and admissions decisions and take an important step to ensuring that young Americans are judged on their qualifications rather than on their skin color. Thank you. I have a copy of the resolution. I've never seen that resolution before it was read out. The reason I ask for that, by the way, happy Halloween, I have a bow tie on it. <laughs> um, the reason I ask for the resolution is because uh, my distinguished opponent um, ignored it. 
It, so it, it says, in light of Fisher versus University of Texas, resolved colleges and universities should abandon their use of affirmative action programs, including preferences for athletes, legacies, veterans, and minority communi uh, communities in the admissions process. Okay, so that was what we were brought here to do. And so, um, in terms of my, my distinguished colleague that talked about, well, it's really not about um, remedying um, the ills of society in kind of a dismissive way. Um, it's really about racial spoils. So there was a redefinition as to what we were here for today, although that really wasn't what the rule was here today. And it's very instructive, in my view, because he's rewritten the rules at the podium, which is the way that society works very often to the disadvantage of minorities, ignoring the affirmative action programs which exist apart from plus factors that are used in affirmative action for um, African Americans. And so, that being said, let me just say this. Uh, we've always had affirmative action. It's just never really been for minorities. Um, I just happened to pick up a copy of the Notre Dame magazine talking about the Admissions Balancing Act. And it was very instructive because, frankly, uh, it kind of said what I was going to say, but what it says is now the school's 83% Catholic. Now, I was raised I'm a cultural Catholic. I was raised Catholic and went to all, you know, Catholic schools, a Jesuit, um, University of Detroit Jesuit High School. We were one of the, we still are, one of the big feeder schools for Notre Dame. You know, we all went to Notre Dame or Georgetown or Holy Cross. But what this says is um, the belief that students learn more, and this is from Notre Dame, uh, the head of admissions, that students learn more in and out of the classroom if they're thrown together people from different backgrounds than their own. Um, there isn't a lot of diversity, for example, I've noticed, I have to say, in the room today. But the university also wants to satisfy the desire of many of its alumni, an overwhelmingly Caucasian and homogenous group, to see their children follow in their footsteps. Accepting legacy students has the added benefit that the second, third, or whatever generation domers, is that what y'all call yourself? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I shouldn't laugh. We, we call our the UVA uh, Cavaliers and Hooves and things like that. So. Um, so, so then there's this longstanding commitment um, that third or ge whatever generation domers typically arrive already passionate about the place. Then there's Notre Dame's longstanding commitment to fielding football or other athletic teams capable of competing for national titles and TV ratings, enliven the atmosphere of campus, and sometimes <coughs> generating major revenue, um, and enhancing the name recognition of the brand. Athletes are not always the best scholars, but at one, when it comes to relaxing admission standards, uh, accommodations are made. Notre Dame sometimes gives special considerations to, say, also a cellist who struggled in high school. Calculus, but soft, can saw through Griggs, Holberg, Sweet, like Yo-Yo Ma, especially if the university orchestra is in need of a cellist. This is the balancing act. And so what I say is, We've always had these kind of affirmative action programs. We never really called them affirmative action programs. They were all were always preferences. They've always existed. They just never existed until very recently for people of color. And this, um, so I would ask a question. Question number one, does this make sense under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment? So we have affirmative action for football players. Do they add value to the school? probably do, probably didn't have the grade grades you did, or you did, well maybe they did, I don't know, but um, do they add value to the school? Should we end that for football players? Should we, should we stop that um, in light of what Notre Dame says is its search for a national title, which 
seems a little bit far off, even though they did beat Michigan this year. But and then the affirmative action for legacy. Okay, so now I am a parent. I've got kids, and I went to schools that I would love to see my kids go to. I mean, that's just the way it is. When you're a parent, that's what it is. You go to a school, you want your kid kind of to go to the same school. They have very different ideas. I will tell you that right now. Um, so you may have been very, very, you know, hip on UVA or an Albion College, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are going to. Um, want it or be a good fit, but you have that thing, it's part of your culture, it's part of your educational DNA. And so, is that a good thing that you have a son or a daughter who came to the school that you wanted the same experience that you had? Is there this continuity, this tradition? I think you could probably argue that that does make some sense. A lot of people make the argument, no, we should, ne we should never do that. Um, what about should we stop that practice? What about for veterans? They've served their country in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and so we give them plus factors in the admissions process. Should we stop doing that? Or is that something that is important to do? Does that have value? What about Catholics? Okay, so it says that 83% of the student body here are Catholics. Uh, that's a preference. Um, now, I'm no longer a practicing Catholic, I guess I'm culturally Catholic, like I said, but that's, you get a plus factor for that if you want to go to Notre Dame. Um, what about like for my feeder schools? You get certain benefits if you go to certain schools. I can tell you right now, um, every admissions person will tell you that. I went to the University of Detroit Jesuit High School and Academy. U.S. News and World Report, top 50 high school in the country. Um, you and I were just talking about how, you know, it's the joint. I mean, you go, to, you, you go to that school, it's like a university. In fact, it's harder than most universities. It is that and Cranbrook and Country Day are certainly the three most rigorous, prestigious schools in the state of Michigan. Ivy League admissions, top on um, SAT and ACT, it's, it gets you ready. Um, and the priests that teach the classes and all that also usually write the textbooks. That's how, that's how rigorous it is. But I can, go, go, coming from U of D High, apply to Notre Dame or Georgetown or Holy Cross. And just because I went there, I'm going to get a few points. Is that affirmative action? Um, they like that school, but what about the kid that went to Cass Technical High School, which is a great public school in Detroit? Is that fair? Um, what about the same thing for firms that interview at the top schools? It's called the Wink. So, Downstairs or wherever they do the interviews for um, Patton Boggs and Blow or for Sullivan and Cromwell or Cravath or the nation's great uh, big law schools. And I know it must be the same, same at Notre Dame as it was when I was at UVA. You've got a couple rooms. You <coughs> sign up when you want to talk to these law firms. And sometimes if you've gone to Notre Dame, they'll go, all right, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll get your transcript at a certain point. But Notre Dame, has a brand, like UVA has a brand. And when you interview at certain firms, let's say you can make the first cut and they do a fly and they fly you out to Cleveland to Jones Day or they fly you out to New York to Sullivan Cromwell or whatever, you know, you get there and they say, ah, we'll deal with the grades later. You went to UVA, you gotta be good, you know. That's the wink, that's what happens. Um, or what about the, um, uh, without, it's the, by the way, it's the wink without the transcript. Um, but what about for geography and the regional balancing? And I talked to you about the cellist or the great oboe player that maybe has the C plus average. These are affirmative action programs because they um, have really nothing to do with their academic prowess. Okay, so is this good? My, um, one, one of my best buddies freshman year at Albion College, Albion's a small, a liberal arts school, um, although it's founded by Methodists, mostly Catholics go there. It's in the western part of Michigan, and Cameron was one of my best buddies. And he <coughs> grew up on a farm, and he went to a mid-Michigan high school. And I was really never sure, because uh, we never really got into that in the year that we were together on Ground East at Albion. I never really got into how good was Marshall High School versus the University of Detroit Jesuit High School and Academy. I do know that he grew up on a farm. And I grew up in the city. Well, I was born in Hawaii. I'm a military brat. I do have my birth certificate. <laughs> and, uh, 
we moved around to military bases and things like that around, you know, but settled in Detroit. But, you know, so I went to, I went to the University of Detroit, Detroit High School in Canada. And here's a guy who comes, to, you know, to, uh, from, uh, from a far farming community. What if his background wasn't as rigorous as you deep highs? But I never really met anybody that grown up on a farm before. And I can tell you, not only did we become fast and fear, uh, fast and furious friends, fast friends, it helped me when I got appointed to various positions in the Michigan legislature where I had to deal with uh, state representatives and state senators from all different walks of life and plenty from the farming communities. Did that help me? Probably did. Um, so it really kind of didn't matter to me that um, Cameron hadn't gone to U of D High. Um, he enhanced my experience and my world view, my Belton shop. This double standard that we have, where we have all of these affirmative action programs for all these other groups, and it's good, and we have to keep them, and we can't touch them, but we don't like to call them affirmative action programs, and not for African Americans, that double standard is the central fallacy of arguments against affirmative action because it ignores the world the way it is. And the bottom line is the argument here is not, as you say, the spoils, quote unquote, racial spoils, but it is about the Wizard of Oz. It is about the wizard telling Dorothy, do not look at that man behind the curtain. Do not look at the way our society actually really works. Just look at the way that I say that it works and that I believe that it should work. So when I say these preferences, these other people have had preferences under the Wizard of Oz standard. And as Justice Powell recognized in Bakke and Justice O'Connor recognized in Grutter versus Bollinger, colleges have traditionally had broad latitude to define traditionally what is best for their academic dynamic at their institution. But my friend says he knows better. Now, therefore, shouldn't I have a cause of action against Purdue? So, even though they see themselves as this engineering school, I'm Mr. English. You know, how long do I have? 30 seconds. 30 seconds? Oh, all right. Well, um, so I should be able to sue Purdue because I think I'm the best and I'm the most qualified and I'm, I'm this English student and even though you see yourself as this great engineering school and you've got all these spots reserved for engineers and I don't have that, that's unfair because I'm the most qualified. I get to decide, not you, Purdue. And that's really, again, what this is about. Um, so shouldn't I have that case as Mr. English student? Or about the high-tech folks that set aside all of these high-tech seats at MIT, even though I bring my Chaucer reading self in my application to MIT? Doesn't that discriminate against me? Well, Justice Powell and uh, Justice O'Connor says, You've got a pretty strong First Amendment right to say what is the academic dynamic. And I'm going to end with this. By the way, it's in your own economic self-interest because U.S. News and World Report has just added uh, diversity to its rankings. Uh, because what it is now recognized is that um, you know, when I'm not representing the NAACP, I represent Fortune 100 companies and Fortune 500 companies. They are not going to hire students from um, homogenous schools. They don't want it. And that's what all the amicus briefs um, that my friend didn't talk about that got filed in Gruder and Gratz and in the case that we won at the University of Michigan, that's what they all say. They want to hire from diverse environments because they know that the more diverse, the more excellent. Thank you. I'm going to take moderator's privilege because both of them went a little over and let's just do like one minute. Okay. Um, look, I'm for affirmative action. I'm against racial preferences. And, you know, let's not play these, you know, debaters games. I didn't know what the resolution was. But, but you know, if you want to debate how much preferences for legacy <coughs> versus students versus cellists, that's a matter of policy. The difference between all of those factors and what is at issue in Fisher, you know, the Supreme Court is not going to take a case about how many preferences to give uh, athletes. You know why? It's not because athletes are privileged in our society. It's because race is a protected class. The government, you know, not me, not Notre Dame, 
the government and government institutions are not allowed to judge people on account of race except when they uh, survive exceedingly high standards and narrowly tailor their programs uh, that, in a way that their completely compelling goal would not be achieved uh, in any other manner. And this is not a matter of you know, getting a few points uh, bonus for being, having played the cello at Carnegie Hall or being an Olympian or, or even being good on your high school football team. The difference, the preference that race gets is equivalent to the getting straight A's versus straight B's or B minuses. It's uh, worth more than any particular factor. And they don't have a quotas or points anymore, but in terms of outcomes, in terms of looking at uh, how the, the average grades are by, by racial group. Um, and there's a whole host of problems with that. You know, stigmatization, uh, I mean, I won't go into it. I'm sure you're, you're, you're all aware of these different things. Look, the legal case here is very easy. I mean, Texas is, is, is going to lose. The question is how much of Grutter survives, whether they're going to give guidance, et cetera, et cetera. The larger issues are very difficult. What, how do we deal in our society with the continuing uh, problems left over from our uh, unfortunate legacy of uh, slavery and Jim Crow and all the rest of it, and, and uh, uh, racism against uh, Asians and Hispanics and, and different uh, people. But that's not, an, you know, the, the answer to that is not giving racial preferences. That's like, that's not even using a bazooka to kill a fly and fly instead of a fly swatter. It's using a bazooka to clean the floor. It's using a, a tool for a completely different issue. You know, let's, let's talk then about our, our K-12 education system or or what have you. I mean, this is not about whether diversity is a good thing. This is about whether people should be judged on the color of their skin uh, for admission to, to, to universities. Well, I reiterate my um, Wizard of Oz um, premise because, again, there was an ignoring of the reality of the situation as we find it. I didn't hear a response to the Affirmative Action Program store for everybody else except for minorities. Let me go to the argument that I hear all the time about the stigma. You must be so stigmatized. Um, in fact, Justice Thomas wrote that. He wrote, um, these programs stamp minorities with a badge of inferiority and may cause them to develop dependencies or to adopt an attitude that they are entitled to preference. Um, now, at the time that the first George Bush appointed Justice um, Thomas to the court, I don't think there was a single legal scholar in America that thought he was the most qualified for that position to sit in Thurgood Marshall's chair, the greatest lawyer of the 20th century. He didn't seem to be too bothered about the stigma there. The other thing is, uh, it is election season, and I do have to raise this. Affirmative action is another thing. I didn't raise it. You know, um, Matt, I did go to UVA, so I have to do this. It's Thomas Jefferson School. Um, so they, they baked affirmative action into the Constitution. It's called the U.S. Senate. Uh, where they give uh, two votes to every, two senators to every state, uh, no matter the fact that Montana has 900,000 people and Michigan has 9 million. That's kind of affirmative action, but what they wanted to do was to keep uh, the union uh, together. And, uh, so um, let's go to the race question, as was specifically addressed, and saying, well, we're just against that part of it. Well, you know, that's kind of a big part of it. Um, in um, what you're going to be seeing in the theaters in about two weeks, although maybe you won't see it in two weeks because you'll be studying for finals with this thing called Lincoln. Um, and um, uh, so race has been omnipresent in the history of this country and is distinguished from any other group in America. It is distinguished in the way that African Americans were brought here and the legacy um, of it throughout our history. And so, um, I even say, you know, it's not so much ancient history when I say, I don't know if you remember in March of this year, the chief judge of the Montana District Court uh, said, uh, he says uh, this. His name is Richard Siebel. He sent an email. This is a man confirmed by the Senate. He's the chief judge of the Montana District Court. It was a, it was a text message under the heading, quote, a mom's memory, unquote. Quote, normally, I don't send or forward a lot of these, but even by my standards, it was a bit touching. I wasn't all, uh, I want all my friends to feel what I felt when I read this. I hope it touches your heart like it does mine. And then the joke that follows is uh, a very offensive joke about the president's biracial parentage. He was the chief federal judge for the state. And by the way, still on the, the bench, 
even though the Ninth Circuit has them under investigation. So um, I have to deal with a lot of these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just ancient history. It's not just the fact that when my dad became the first black surgeon in Detroit, when he would walk into the operating room, they would take his uh, things, the other doctors were, they'd throw his, uh, um, his operating um, uh, tools uh, against the wall. My mom's still never gotten over it. Or, you know, the things that I've had to go through, or my kids have to go through. Or just, how long do I have? You're done. I'm done? <laughs> so much to say. So little time. Thank you. Well, I want to thank both of our participants for um, giving their impassioned pleas to their side. Um, I do want to say that this is a really, this is a really tri tricky issue, and it's not a black and white issue. It's a gray issue, which is why you see um, so many divergent views on, on, on how these cases should come out. Um, I think my personal reading or listening of the Supreme Court arguments is that this case is going to turn a lot on how you define critical mass. So part of what was said in Grutter is that, it, that preferences, it's okay that you, if you want to pursue diversity, and if part of what you're trying to do is to make sure that you have enough minorities so that they don't feel like tokens, and so that there's a critical mass so that they don't feel isolated in the educational process. And, and the Supreme Court used the word critical mass, but didn't define the word critical mass, and the Supreme Court beat up on the participants at oral argument for not defining critical mass appropriately. So, how would y'all define critical mass, and when is there a sufficient critical mass where you no longer need, assuming that diversity is, is a legitimate aim, let's start with that assumption. So if we assume leg diversity is a legitimate aim, what is, what is sufficient critical mass to, to alleviate our concerns? It's undefinable. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think I'd probably agree to that. I, I, w I wouldn't I wouldn't say there's you know it's it's kind of like the Supreme Court's definition of obscenity. You know when you see it. Um, <coughs> when I when I look around the the, the room and I don't I don't see that many uh, minority faces. I know that it's unre underrepresented here, and so um, I don't think it, it has to be a, a specific number. But I know, for example, when I got to UVA. And uh, I was president of the Black Law Students Association. UVA had just started admitting women in the mid '70s. I mean, uh, but we had one woman professor, no black professors. I think you guys have two or whatever. But even today, um, you know. So, uh, so this is not ancient history. And what? I, so what I know is what I, you know, seeing that I know that that's certainly um, not serving society. Okay, so this question is from Mr. Shapiro. So you spent a lot of time on the strong basis and evidence formulation, and um, one of the amici um, responded to, your, to the argument that was in your, in your brief and said, um, this court developed a strong basis and evidence formulation of strict scrutiny in cases turning on a government's factual claim that it had discriminated in the past or could be guilty of contemporaneous discrimination if it did not use race. The court has not imported the strong basis and evidence formulation into the context of admissions where a university is attempting to use race not to undo past discrimination, but rather to achieve part of its core educational mission. Before you respond, I want to read from part of the amicus brief that Notre Dame was a part of, where it states, Notre Dame's mission statement asserts that the intellectual interchange essential to a university requires and is enriched by the presence and voices of diverse scholars and students. Well, Notre Dame is a private institution. And that's what uh, um, I would have mentioned with a, a bit more rebuttal time. Um, Mr. Hollowell's example of Catholics, for example, um, the University of Texas could not enforce 80% Catholics or, or any percent, because that's a religious test, and religion is a protected class, just like uh, race is. Um, so, I mean, the strong basis and evidence standard is a way that courts have uh, uh, employed uh, to try to figure out how to apply strict scrutiny in a racial context. I mean, we can quibble over whether the ACLU is right, it's their brief that went after Cato's brief, whether they're right or whether we're right in terms of how the courts in, interpret this in a uh, higher education context. Um, but essentially, what the, you know, however the, you phrase the magic words, the point is um, strict scrutiny means that the uh, desired goal has to be compelling enough, and not just diversity, but reaching 
a certain type of you know, critical mass or however you want to define it uh, in per classroom, per student body, on top of your, you know, the facts are specific to the, to the Texas case are different than they might be in a different way. Uh, and that what you're doing is narrowly tailored to achieving that. And a strong basis in evidence is, uh, uh, goes towards the, uh, how compelling the, um, uh, the interest is that, that you're promoting. And so, Mr. Hallwell, I have a, a question. I am a Texan. I am a Texan who benefited from the top 10% plan because of top 10%. UT and A&M were my safeties, um, so, which are pretty good safeties, all things considered. Um, my question is, why isn't the top 10% plan sufficient? Why do they have to do more? Why, why, why should we buy into that argument? Um, well, I think it's the Justice Powell test. <laughs> you know, I mean, what Justice Powell said uh, very specifically um, is in, in Baki, he said that um, a university in using affirmative action to admit minorities is, quote, seeking to achieve a goal that is of paramount importance to the fulfillment of its mission, and that the, quote, interest of diversity is compelling. He found it to be a compelling state interest, compelling in the context of a university's admission program. This, he determined, is an exercise of a university's long-established First Amendment right of academic freedom. Now, he found that um, in the Bakke case that it wasn't narrowly tailored. But what I'm saying is that um, what are schools? You know, they're, they're laboratories for ideas, and they are training grounds for <coughs> our future leaders. And they serve a different and distinct mission. And so what we're saying is that by having a critical mass and having a diverse environment makes it more excellent. UVA became better, by the way. When I graduated in 84, it was always a top 20 school. After it, it's now got 23% minority, it's a top five school. Um, so it allows them to fulfill the mission of training leaders, and judges, and CEOs. Um. Before I open up to the floor, I'll just say that Notre Dame's Hammock Street was based on, the arguments were all based on First Amendment claims, but what he was just saying. So, students, anybody have questions? I have a question I'd like to pose to, to both. Um, in recognizing race or the color of one's skin in applications process, <coughs> the point system, meaning of quota, et cetera, doesn't that acknowledge that there is some sort of difference between people that we still have to recognize on some level, doesn't that still create a wedge and a difference between minority and non-minority individuals? Rather than coming together as a society entity, we're still seem to be fragmenting. And how does that differ between the color of one's skin versus what you identified earlier as the cello player or the football player having a specific skill that might set apart? How is color of skin and a skill equivalent in admission standards? Um, I, I agree that when you're talking about diversity, you really do need to define your terms. And I don't know what diversity it adds to have just people of different skin color. Let's say they they all have the same background and the, the same uh, preferences, uh, artistic preferences, and uh, political views, and you know they're alike in every way except their skin color is different. That to me is less diverse than an you know an all-black or an all-white group of people that come from all over the place, some working class, some you know, kids of doctors and lawyers, uh, some that are military brats and, and, and what have you. And so um, I think there is room, if there's a way to implement it without it serving as, a, as an illegitimate proxy for just using race, to have some sort of socioeconomic status uh, preference based on potential uh, of achievement, maybe in college, maybe less so for, for, uh, for law school and probably even less so for, for graduate school because the, you know, the, as you get more and more towards tangible measures of achievement rather than, than intangible ones. Um, but yeah, I do think that the part of the problem with having racial preferences is indeed that uh, it promotes kind of balkanization and, and segregation in that way because you're saying that you know, your worth is based on your skin color, not on your background or what else you, you might bring to the table. And indeed, you're supposed to uh, represent your race in all your interactions and educate uh, you know, the majority of, about your perspective based on your race, not your background. Well, it's a point among a number of other points. So it isn't, 
an exclusive factor? And number two, why is it that that factor is even important? And you say that, well, um, shouldn't we just forget all that? Let's just forget you know, all that. Well, you know, um, that isn't the world that we live in. And uh, to the extent that it can benefit uh, the rest of the uh, academic environment, it, we, it, should use, it, it should be used to do so. Um, I just got a call, um, I guess about 10 days ago, from Channel 7, uh, the WXYZ affiliate, for me to, to do an investigation because the Dearborn uh, Police, which is a suburb of Detroit where Ford World Headquarters is, uh, there was a party and they broke up the party and there was a mixed crowd and it turns out a group of girls who were 15, 16 got picked up and um, for being too noisy. The long and the short of it is that the um, the girls, this one group of girls, uh, six of them, came to the party together. One was white, five were black. The five black girls <coughs> were taken to the Dearborn police station and got booked for disorderly conduct and strip search. The Dearborn police drove the white girl, who they had all come together with, home, and admonished the mother, saying, look at who you're, you know, you're going to be hanging out with. I'm saying that this happens all the time. This is not a kind of a outlier that happens in the calls that I get at the NAACP. Last week, I'm sure, as my colleague can tell you, Stanford and the Associated Press just came out with a major study indicating that racial attitudes in the last four years since the president was elected has actually gotten worse. And so is race still a factor that should be used in order for us to try to talk to each other in advanced society? You betcha. See, I don't see why the continuing racism in society has anything to do with whether we should have racial preferences and how to, how to achieve diversity. Because the Supreme Court has said repeatedly that uh, remediating past racism is not a valid reason for having racial preferences. That's not what they said. Uh, it, it is what they said. <laughs> and so, 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 point of privilege, um, under the constitutional prong, I would have to agree with you that remediation is, is, is not sufficient. That you have to look forward looking towards diversity's goals. But under the statutory Title VII type affirmative action, remediation is still technically good luck. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, in, in the, what we're dealing with, admission in, uh, in racial preferences and college admission, <coughs> we're not supposed to have some sort of remedial or racial balancing or reparations or any sort of thing. You're supposed to go towards uh, diversity, part, partly because, you know, because of our history, we don't have that naturally. You have to have these certain things is how the court goes. But all of these examples of racism and, uh, you know, our story past is not uh, is not reason to discriminate uh, continue discriminating people on the basis of their skin so sorry it's not, it's not our sorry past it's our sorry present and uh, so what I'm saying here is that one still we haven't dealt with the central question uh, of what the resolution was in terms of the fact that you have um, affirmative action programs for everyone except for minorities and that still hasn't been dealt with by my opponent, and number two, not protected class. I dealt with it, and and not and number two, uh, that universities must have uh, the academic freedom that uh, normally is accorded to them under the First Amendment, as Justice Powell has said, and that's good law today. So whether uh, whether we, you, you want to put it in a certain way or not, the fact is you have a First Amendment right to say this is how we want our campus to look. And this is better for society. By the way, when you graduate, there's a lot of black judges and CEOs and others that you're going to have to come in front of. And so having a diverse uh, background in school will help you with that. In the 50s, well, okay. Texas was so arguing let's, 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 academic freedom to justify segregation. And when you get out there, you're going to have employers that aren't going to want to hire black people or judges that are going to want to uh, accept the representations of black lawyers. These same arguments, tremendously ironic and offensive. Well, it's offensive, but it wasn't offensive as to the Cato Institute and others at the time. Because at the time that they were doing it, they were on the other side, um, not saying anything or um, being supportive of the fact that you had a lot of these laws that were put in place uh, to keep African Americans from voting, so we're gonna, having we're fair move, housing. We're going to move on. We're going to move on. We're going to move on. I was same year I was born, by the way. Yeah, graduated Sorry. from high school. Another question for you. Uh, 
with the stigma argument, it seems to me that that's inevitable. If you change, if you have it so that the black or whatever minority folks who are coming into a school are academically less qualified, that seems to me inevitable to perpetuate the stereotype that African Americans are not as smart. Says who? Less, less qualified says who? Based on your standard, less qualified. You say, just because I have a C and you've got a B, you're more qualified than I am? And I ran the school newspaper, and I was president of the student senate, and I was captain of the debate team, and I, yeah, I did all those things. And, and, and so, so I'm saying I'm sure, that, I'm sure so you also got higher than C. So you're saying, so you're saying you define, you define what's qualified. I didn't, what, I didn't define it. As you it did in the question. Well, what gives you the right to do that? I'm Who saying, determines? When, when, an academic, when, when an institution looks at a qualified applicant, right, or a non-qualified applicant, they're going to look at all these things. They're going to look at whether you were the president of the debate. All those things count. I'm not just saying. And we were good. Enough, we okay. were good. So looking at the whole person, at their, all their skills and those sort of things, right? But if you do that, and then you're still admitting folks who are less qualified holistically, not just on the numbers, I don't see how it doesn't perpetuate. Your, your premise is wrong. I very respectfully say that because you say less qualified. I say in many instances, based on what I know that certain people have to go through, more qualified. But let me also say this as a lesson in life. Don't worry so much about what people think about you. I think you should think about what you think about yourself. Otherwise, what happens is we become judged in terms of who we think we are by the validation externally of what people think of us. You just move forward and you do the best you can. I think he meant academically qualified, and then there's no response to the question. But let me say wait, that wait, wait, we're so doing this. I'm responding to the. Can I not re respond? No, 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 no. You, okay, go ahead. Um, we, we were doing this uh, discussion under kind of an assumption that the only uh, that that the minorities that get the racial preferences are everything. <coughs> Society might be hurt. That's a debate. Uh, the, the people who are being discriminated against certainly are hurt. Uh, but minorities uh, do benefit, and we're sort of arguing, is it worth it, for what reasons, what the legal standards. But uh, the, uh, the research suggests that even the minorities that get the racial preferences are hurt in terms of ha achieving a, a level of mismatch. That is, they get into a better school than they would otherwise if they were a different race, and therefore holding constant for who was the president of the debate team, the student said, and all those things. Just leaving the only difference between students of the same academic qualifications, but one goes to a higher school, higher rank, more prestigious, etc. One goes to a lower rank school, and the one that goes to the lower rank school is more likely, much more like, likely, to pass the bar, to graduate in four years, to stay in that rigorous science engineering curriculum rather than being uh, going to a different thing. That detriment to the people who are actually receiving the racial preferences, I think, puts paid to the, it's a, the, the notion is, it's, it's called mismatch. Uh, there's a book that just came out earlier this month uh, by Stuart Taylor and Rick Sander. Uh, about this, I, it's it's fascinating, and it goes all sorts of different ways. Um, but I mean, it, it really I think we need to re-examine whether we're actually hurting the people that uh, we think or just assuming are are being helped. That's Wizard of Oz all over again. That is absolutely opposite of what the research shows. It is opposite. What it shows is that the minorities that are admitted to elite schools actually do better than they do in the others. Number one. Number two. I've tried the case at the University of Michigan. I know what the evidence says. Here's what the evidence says. At the University of Michigan, <coughs> the question is, does affirmative action work? Uh, the, the research shows, it studied, we studied um, how our minority students did after graduation at the law school. We looked at how much money they make, I know that got your attention, uh, how far up in the profession did they go, how satisfied were they from their careers, and their social contributions. And the conclusion was that they did just as well as their white counterparts given a chance. Completely opposite of what you just heard. Okay, so part of the reason that these issues are so difficult is because different studies say different things. So if you read Rick Sanders' amicus brief and you read about his mismatch theory, then you assume that there's all sorts of harms to African Americans. If you read a lot of Derek Bell's work, where he where he go and others who say who say in response to academic qualifications point that SAT scores, LSAT scores, incoming um, GPA scores, those actually aren't good predictors of how well you do in the first year of of 
whatever it is, whether it's college or law school or whatever. So it just depends on which study you want to look at. Next question. Um, and that's, I'm sorry, that's the last question. I've been told. I, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned <coughs> that it's clearly better to have diversity in schools. And now that the U.S. World News Reports is starting to take into account diversity in ranking schools, do you think that there's any possibility of maybe getting a more, I guess, I'll call it like a market-based approach? Okay, we're actually going to say this school's not as good because it's not admitting as much diversity, and therefore we're going to bump it, and in order for the school to stay elite, they're going to start becoming more diverse without requiring... I mean, I think that... Most people would agree that if at some point we can just completely stop caring about race in every instance and everything's just completely genuinely fair, that would be best. Do you think that that's going in the right way? Do you think there are any other ways we can get that's there? That's a very sophisticated question, and I'll bet you that my, my, uh, my esteemed colleague and I agree on this. In the end, that's, I think, the goal, and it's already starting to happen. Um, it's, it's happening by um, corporate selection, where you have CEOs, uh, Fortune 100 companies that are saying, "I'm not, I'm not going to hire. I'm not going to hire anybody that goes to a homogenous school." And they're not. They're not doing it because they don't think that it helps them. And I can tell you, as far as lawyers are concerned, you walk into a courtroom and you don't have a diverse legal team, and you're walking in there, you're behind the eight ball. You're going to lose your cases. And so it's going to happen. That is going to happen. I can tell you from personal experience of trying these cases. And in representing company CEOs uh, in um, you know in what they talk about in terms of board resolutions and where they're going, I think they are headed where you are. I, I, so we may uh, we may agree on that. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, we agree on the broadest terms that in the end we want utopia, sure, but that's you know not saying very much. Uh, what this is an indication of the preference for you by U.S. News and Fortune 500 companies is it's a very strong indication of what the prevailing political correctness is. You know, 50 years ago, the prevailing political correctness is you don't, you don't want a diverse thing, or you don't want different colored people <coughs> for whatever reason. And now it's, you know, you're being a bad corporate citizen, or it's just, you know, it, it's a very strong political correctness uh, among the, you know, elite institutions that is that makes its way through society. Now, to the extent that this is an anti-racism thing, fantastic. To the extent that it actually is promoting people, not based on their merit, however you define that, whether that be leadership ability, raw scores, you know, whatever it is, um, I don't think uh, it's a good thing. And yeah, obviously institutions are going to be responding to market forces, and they will, you know, law schools will adjust their admissions based on, oh, so we get a higher bump for admitting, you know, five more black students rather than having our average LSAT score go up a, a point, all right, we'll make that trade-off. You know, yeah, they're going to be very good at responding to those uh, sorts of incentives. Well, I, one thing, let me just tell you, have, having spent time in the private sector, I can tell you, the one thing that corporate CEOs are not are politically correct. They are bottom line. GM and General Electric, they're going to hire because they want to make money. So I don't know what he's talking about. Um, <laughs> so unfortunately, we, uh, thank you. We do need to wrap things up. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This has been a very spirited discussion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, how are you? Here, let me come around. I was done to ask a question. Yes. Uh,